So Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, that's the entire chapter. Let's go ahead and get into the study itself as we're looking at the text of this evening. Just going to pull up this slide that we have seen over and over in this class. Uh, remember the book of Revelation divides very nicely into two halves. There's chapters 1 through 11, then there's chapters 12 through 22. Both halves of the book of Revelation tell the exact same story, but they tell it from a different perspective. And so chapters 1 through 11 are telling the story uh, from the perspective of the struggle on the earth, whereas chapters 12 through 22 are telling the same story, but this time from the perspective, the deeper spiritual background, if you will. And so we are in those first 11 chapters, very specifically what we started in our last class, was the throne scene, chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. We did chapter 4. Tonight, we're going to be looking at chapter 5, which concerns Christ, the lion lamb, who was slain and is worthy to take the book. And we're going to look at all of that then as we go through this chapter. Looking at an overview, though, of chapter 5, what we find here is that chapter 5 is the second half of the unit that begins in chapter 4. There are a lot of units in the the book of Revelation. There are, there are sections of the book that stick together and form a unit. Chapters 4 and 5 form a unit. It's called the throne scene. That's what's going on in those two chapters. Um, in chapter 4, the focus is on God the Father who is on the throne. Chapter 5, which is the chapter we're looking at this evening, uh, in that chapter, the focus is on Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. But chapters 4 and 5, this throne scene, are introduced by the statement that's made in chapter 3 and verse 21, where we read, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So that's found there in chapter 3, verse 21. It introduces then this throne scene that we have in chapters 4 and 5. And so we looked at chapter 4 a week ago tonight. If you want to see that video, let me just say this. Uh, some of y'all are here for the first time this evening. If you want to see previous videos, they are all on our church Facebook page. And so if you have found us this evening for this presentation, all you need to do is go to that church Facebook page, look in the section on videos, and all of those previous videos are right there. So you can go back and get caught up if you'd like to do that. Um, okay, so that's the introduction to chapter 5. Let's go ahead and get into the chapter itself, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4 together. So Revelation chapter 5, starting at verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. We remember, chapter 4, that's God the Father. So in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So verses one through four, we have the question, who is worthy to open the scroll? The father, the one who is seated on the throne, holds a scroll. That scroll represents God's eternal purpose, and it represents what's happening in the book of Revelation. I might just throw this out here, that that scroll is sealed with seven seals. We're going to look at those seven seals as we go farther into the book of Revelation. So here the Father has this scroll that's sealed with seven seals, representing God's eternal purpose. Hold your spots there in Revelation chapter 5. We're going to we're going to go back and forth this evening and look at some other passages, but I would like for us to look at least in passing at Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Remember, Ezekiel is apocalyptic literature. It's apocalyptic literature of the Old Testament, uh, just like Revelation is apocalyptic literature of the New Testament. And in Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, this is what we read. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. So the scroll, the book there that Ezekiel's got, that Ezekiel has 
uh, open. Before him is a scroll that represents God's eternal purpose, at least in this particular case, in what God is doing with the nation of Judah. Uh, when we get to the book of Revelation, it's God's eternal purpose as to what he is doing with his people. That's the message of the book of Revelation, what's going on in the book. That's what that scroll is about. So go ahead and go back to Revelation chapter 5. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, let's continue on. Again, this scroll that is there is sealed with seven seals. Those seals have not yet been broken. They are not open. Again, this is something we're not familiar with because uh, we lick the back of our envelope, stick a stamp on it, and put it in the mail. In the ancient world, if you wanted to make sure... If you wanted to make sure that your letter had not been opened, you put a seal on it. And in order to open that letter, you'd have to break the seal. And so it'd be very, very obvious if someone had opened the letter and read the contents. So we have this scroll here in chapter 5 that is sealed with seven seals. Remember in the book of Revelation, numbers generally have significance. Uh, numbers are important. And when you see the number seven, you need to take notice of that because seven is that number of perfection or completeness. And so this scroll is sealed. It is sealed perfectly. There are seven seals. We're going to see those seals open uh, here uh, in the next uh, in the next couple of chapters. Okay. Um, so the question is, we've got this scroll here, it's sealed. Who in the world is going to be able to open it? When one is found who is worthy to open it, then that plan and purpose will begin to be executed. It'll begin to unfold. You know, a scroll would be uh, scrolled open. And so when the seals are broken, it's going to open up. We're going to be able to see that plan and purpose begin to be executed. And so the question here in verses one through four is who is worthy to open the seals? Who is worthy to open that scroll so that the plan can get going? And here in verses one through four, what we find is that no heavenly, no earthly, or no sub-earthly being was found who was worthy to unseal it. So no human can undo it. No heavenly creature can undo it. No sub-earthly being, that which is under the earth. I'm not even sure what that would be. The point of the message is there is no one who is found worthy to open it. And because of that, John's reaction is one of sorrow. He weeps because he understands how important it is for God's plan to be unveiled and for God's plan to begin to be executed. And so in order for that to happen, the scroll's got to be open. But there isn't anybody there worthy to open that scroll. Well, you probably know where this is going, especially if you've read chapter 5. So no heavenly or earthly or sub-earthly being can open it. So what's going to happen? Well, into this then comes the lion lamb. You're there in Revelation chapter 5. Let's go ahead and read verses 5 through 7 together. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So we have this lion lamb here. The identity of this individual is given to us. This is Jesus Christ. We look at how he's identified here in the text and these are identifications that take us back to the Old Testament so we have this reference here to him being the lion of the tribe of Judah what in the world is that about how in the world is this this lamb how in the world is Jesus Christ the lion of the tribe of Judah take your Bibles and go with me if you would to the Old Testament to Genesis chapter 49 in Genesis chapter 49 we read where this is coming from Genesis chapter 49 look with me at verses 9 and 10 Genesis chapter 49 verses 9 and 10 Judah is a lion's cub from the prey my son you have gone up he stooped down he crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him 
The scepter, we're in verse 10 of Genesis chapter 49, and this is important. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And so we have this blessing that's placed upon Judah in Genesis chapter 49. Judah, the literal Judah in this particular case, but it's really about the tribe, but it's really about the one who's going to come from that tribe. And so he's compared there to being a lion's cub, a lion, even a lioness. And then in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart. And if you remember your history of the Old Testament, when God chooses David to be king, David is of what tribe? He's of the tribe of Judah. Then when we fast forward to the New Testament, we have Jesus, who is now going to be the heavenly king. What tribe is he from? He's from the tribe of Judah, and he's from the house of David. These are all prophecies that had to do with, ultimately, with the Messiah. And so in Revelation chapter 5, he is identified, this lion lamb, Jesus Christ, is identified with this lion of the tribe of Judah. We are meant to to join that to the Old Testament prophecies. He's also said here in Revelation chapter one, verses five through seven, to be of the root or to be the root of David. Let's look at a couple of passages in that regard. Let's go over to 2 Samuel chapter seven. 2 Samuel chapter seven and verse 16. 2 Samuel chapter seven and verse 16. This is what we read. And your house and your kingdom Shall be, uh, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Second Samuel chapter seven, verse 16. Now let's join that to Isaiah chapter 11. First of all, so that we know this is coming from the house of David. That's who this is being addressed to. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. We're gonna look at verse one and then we're gonna look down at verse 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Now, if you continue reading there in Isaiah chapter 11, you know this is a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about the Messiah. Look down at verse 10 here in the same chapter. In that day, the root of Jesse, Jesse was David's father, the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him shall the nations inquire and his resting place shall be glorious. So back in Revelation chapter 5, go ahead and take your Bibles and go back there. Look at verses 5 through 7 with me again. We see Jesus being identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. That all takes us back to these messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. Jesus is going to be worthy to open the scroll. Because Jesus is the one that fulfills these prophecies of the Messiah. He is the Messiah. But what also makes him qualified to open the scroll is that he has conquered. There we have that word again. Remember, we talked about this in the introduction. There's this Greek word that's used over and over in the book of, of, book of Revelation, nikau, to overcome, to conquer. The Greek word Nike comes from that. It's the same word. Uh, one's a noun, one's a verb, okay? He has conquered. This lion lamb, Jesus Christ, has conquered. That's going to make him worthy. Because of these things, he can break the seven seals and open the scroll. So John weeps. John weeps because no one is found who is worthy. It's pointed out to him. One of the elders says to John, don't weep anymore. Jesus is here. Jesus can open the scroll. And when he does, God's plan is going to be put into action. So let's look a little bit farther on at this. We're not quite done with these verses. We have this description here that's given. The lion lamb, he's a slain, he's been slain, but living. He's a special kind of lamb because he was slain, but he's now living. He's standing. The sacrifice of this lamb accomplishes the redemption of God's people, but the lamb isn't dead. The lamb's alive. He's conquered. We already read that. He's conquered because although he was slain, he has come back to life. It's talking about the resurrected Jesus here and what Jesus did. Then we see some other references here in this description. He's described as having seven horns. There's that number seven again, that number uh, describing fullness or perfection. 
What about these horns? Well, horns throughout the scriptures are symbolic of power and strength. And so when we see this applied to Jesus, I'll you picture this for just a moment. He's been described as a lion. Now he's a lamb. He's a lamb that his like he's been slain, but he's standing. He's got seven horns. I have never seen a seven horn horned lamb, but John got to. It's symbolic of the fullness of his power and strength. He also has seven eyes, which the text tells us are the seven spirits. We already know from previous studies, that's the Holy Spirit. So that's how the lion lamb is described in these verses. Let's look on. We're not quite done with these verses yet. Uh, noticing again in this description, Beale says this in his commentary. He says the image here is the image of a conqueror who was mortally wounded while defeating an enemy. But of course, we understand that he is alive. He did not remain dead. And so this lion lamb, this lamb then does what? He takes the scroll because he's the one who is worthy. Okay, so chapter four, we have God on the throne. Chapter five, now we get this scroll. Someone's gonna have to open it. The one who's gonna open it is Jesus Christ. Let's continue then in the chapter. Let's look now at verses six, uh, sorry, verses eight through 10. We have a, what's called the song of the redeemed. Let's look at this for just a moment. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's verses 8 through 10. So we get this song that's sung, but before we get to the song, let's notice the actors that are going on here. We have the four living creatures. We've already talked about them uh, in a previous class. We have the 24 elders. We've talked about them as well from chapter 4. They fall down before the Lamb. They worship Him. But did you notice what they have in conducting that worship? Each one is holding a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The harps here, the Greek word here is kitara. I have a hard time saying that and not saying something like guitar, but it's not guitar. It's a harp kitara. Typical instrument of the Psalms. We read about this over and over in the book of Psalms. Let me just read a couple of examples for you. Psalm 33 and verse 2. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Psalm 57 and verse 8. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will wake, I will awake the dawn. Over and over in the book of Psalms, we see uh, these harps being mentioned. It was a typical instrument of the Psalms. We might, uh, we might have an image in our mind of David also with that instrument in his hands. But not only, not only do they have these harps, they also have these golden bowls of incense, which the text tells us are the prayers of the saints. If we are looking here in this text for a literal harp and a literal golden bowl of incense, we are missing the point. The point is that they are offering spiritual worship, but there's physical elements that are symbolized here. There's an interesting, there's an interesting image from the ancient world, and that is this particular bowl. And if you'll notice that picture there in the middle, that is the Greek god Apollo. And he is pictured with a bowl out of which he is pouring a libation. And he's pictured with that harp, that kitara. This particular bowl was excavated at Delphi in Greece, dates to the 5th century BC. But when you see that, you kind of get a feel for this image here in Revelation chapter 5 where you have the 24 elders falling down before the Lamb, not the one on the throne, before the Lamb in this particular case. They have these harps with which they are praising Him, and they have these golden bowls which are their prayers. And so, then they sing this song of the redeemed. It is called a new song, verse 9. They sing a new song. And in this song, we see people 
who are ransomed by God, by his blood. Look with me if you would. You can hold your spot there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 5. But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look with me at verses 19 and 20. Paul here writing to the church in Corinth says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. When, when Paul is addressing the idea of sexual immorality here in 1 Corinthians, he makes the point that we have been bought with a price. And therefore, we need to glorify God in our bodies. It makes a difference. It's important what we do with our bodies. So people had been ransomed by God, by his blood. You go back to Revelation chapter 5. Let's look at that again. Revelation chapter 5. Let me give you the reference there. It's verse 9, the second half. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. In 1 Corinthians, we read about a price. Revelation tells us what that price was. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. These people have been ransomed by God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And they were made together into a kingdom and priests. We're going to look at those references in just a moment. But let me point out here that the, that the message of Revelation and the message of the New Testament is that the kingdom is comprised of people of every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. Racism has absolutely no place whatsoever within the kingdom of God because all have been brought together and made into one. The motto on the seal of the United States is E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. That's an excellent description, not only of our nation, but particularly of the kingdom of God because out of many, has, has come one out of every tribe, language, people, and nation. One kingdom has been made. All right, let's look at these references here. I chose these. I want us to look at these really quickly, this idea of a kingdom and priest. Look at, look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, this is addressing Old Testament Israel. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the children, to the people of Israel. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests. Israel was to be a holy nation. All the earth belonged to God. But God set Israel apart in a special way. They were to be holy. We are meant as Christians reading the book of Revelation to associate this idea of being kingdom, a kingdom and priest with the Old Testament concept of the nation of Israel. Look with me in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14. He, that's God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom in the New Testament is not in the epistles. Let me say that differently. In the gospels, it is still a future uh, event. But by the time you get to the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, and by the time you get to the epistles, the kingdom is a present reality. It is a present reality in the book of Revelation. They have been made into a kingdom of priests, just like the Old Testament kingdom of priests. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen race, Peter says. This is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. What does that sound like? Sounds like Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6, doesn't it? For his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need to understand that if we are in the kingdom of Christ, we are a royal kingdom. We are a kingdom of Priest, we have been set aside for God's own possession. And we have been set aside so that we may proclaim 
Paul, Peter writes, the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so in the book of Revelation, we have this, this song of the redeemed, this new song, people who are ransomed. Why do they sing that? Why are they praising that? Because they're the ones that have been ransomed as well. And then finally, the last thought, they shall reign on the earth. That's an important message to the people in John's day, because the people in John's day are suffering for the cause of Christ. It doesn't look to them at all like they are reigning on the earth. And yet that's what's said. You're going to come through this. You're going to be victorious. The kingdom will stand. They shall reign on the earth. So we have in this scene so far, we have this scroll. Who's going to open it? Jesus is going to open it. Why? Because he's worthy. And then we have this praise from the four living creatures, the 24 elders, this new song proclaiming what it is that the lion, that the lion lamb has done. Let's continue in the chapter. We've got some more things here to talk about. Verses 11 through 14. The praise here is not quite done. Verses 11 through 14. Then I looked. And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So we get here to the last section of this chapter, the praise of heaven surrounding the central scene. The central scene here is the throne the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they're in the center of this. And of course, of course, the lamb is there as well. And, and God, the father who is seated on the throne. But that's the central scene. Around that, then we have the voice of many angels. And I underline that word many. The text tells us that it is myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. The word myriad there is 10,000. 10,000 times 10,000 equals 100 million, if my math is correct. And 100 million was the highest number used in the Greco-Roman world. I don't think the, the folks of the ancient world would even have a concept of a billion or a trillion because their biggest number was 100 million. But on top of that, there's a thousand times a thousand, so another million. So we have 101 million angels surrounding the central throne and they are praising God. What is this about? It is a huge innumerable number praising the Lamb. Have you ever thought about that? When Jesus was about to be crucified, he said, I can call down legions of angels if I didn't want this to go forward. And so we kind of do our math and kind of figure out how many that is. Oh, that's a lot of angels. Then you get to the book of Revelation. And what the book of Revelation tells us is that God has more angels at his disposal than can even be counted. And they are all there doing his will. And in this particular case, we see them outside that central throne where they are praising the lion lamb. I think that's incredible. When we close our eyes and we read that text and we think about that voice of all of those angels, can we even comprehend what it was that John was blessed to experience and what it is that we get to experience through the words that he recorded? But it's not just the angels because joining in with them is every creature in heaven Every creature on earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea. In other words, everything that exists is going to praise this lamb. Everything that exists is going to praise this lion lamb. Everything that exists is praising Jesus Christ. The four living creatures then at the end of that 
they add their amen to it. And then the 24 elders, they fall down and worship. They worship because the lamb is deity. The lamb is worthy of worship. Jesus Christ is worthy of worship. Remember, we're going to have another slide here in just a moment. But remember, way back when, when we got into the study of the book of Revelation, I said that the book of Revelation is a powerful book for demonstrating the deity of Jesus Christ, for demonstrating that Jesus Christ is God. And we see here on the throne the Father. We see here the lion lamb, this lamb that was as if slain. And we see all of heaven praising him. We see all of earth praising him. We see the four living creatures saying amen to that praise. And then we have these 24 elders. That represents the redeemed of God's people, both of the old covenant and the new. They fall down and worship. And in the book of Revelation, you don't worship the angels. In the book of Revelation, you don't worship the emperor. In the book of Revelation, you, you worship deity, the Father and the Lamb. This is a powerful, powerful chapter for demonstrating who exactly Jesus is. So let's look at that praise because there's something going on here that you may have noticed. You may have remembered that I said a while back that when you see a listing of something in Revelation, do the count. Count to see what you've got there. So we get the praise of the angels. Worthy is the lamb who was, to slain to, who was slain to receive. Then we get a listing. To receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. There are seven. And you are meant to pick up on that. Okay? It is not an accident. There could have been six. There could have been five. But there are seven. What that tells us is that Jesus is worthy to receive everything. What is it that we would put that wouldn't be included in one of those seven words? That's the praise of the angels. Then we have the praise of the creation. Remember what we saw there? Living creature in heaven, earth, under the earth, in the sea, everything of the creation. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Their praise is directed not only to the Lamb, but also the one who sits on the throne, which is the Father. Blessing, honor, glory, and might. There's some overlap, isn't there, between the four and the seven? What's that about? Why four? Remember, seven is the number of completion. Four is the number of the earth in apocalyptic literature. So when we see fours, it's related to the earth. Well, who's doing this praise? Those that are the living creature, every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and in the sea. I'm not, I don't think the heaven there is a reference to heaven, the eternal heaven. I think it's talking about the atmosphere, the heavens, if you will. So the creatures that exist, whether they be in the sky, whether they be on the earth itself, whether they be under the ground, whether they be in the sea, they praise as well. Because they come from the earth, they give four words of honor and blessing. So that's what we've got going on there in this chapter. Now